Hello and welcome to the History with Jackson podcast. Now today we are talking to Stephen Roman, the author, I'm not, I'm not sure if anyone's seen on Instagram yet, but the author of Arles and Empires, Arles and Empire, sorry, I always mess that one up, Romanov, Russia, Britain and the Isle of Wight. Uh, it is a truly fantastic book and I am so happy and glad to welcome Stephen to the podcast today. Hello, Stephen. How are you doing? Hi, Jackson. And very nice to be with you this evening. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Oh, no, no worries at all. I'm really looking forward to getting stuck into chatting about your book with you. I think it's an amazing book and I really enjoyed reading it. And, you know, I've, I've posted that review on my YouTube, uh, which yes. hopefully has sent a few people towards you as well uh so no, yeah it's a very positive review thank you very much <laughs> <laughs> but uh i know i always know when someone's um read the book because of the the, the facts and the passion they bring to describing something which was certainly present in your review very much so <laughs> well the passion was very much evident within your book as well so it's hard not to be passionate and love a book which you can actually feel the love that's gone into writing it Absolutely. uh but you know, we're looking at your book. What was the motivation for writing your book? I know you touch upon a personal family history within your um, within the story. Do you mind telling us about that? Yes. Um, I mean, I've long had an interest in Russian history, Anglo-Russian history, because my grandparents um, fled Russia during the Civil War, during the Revolution, the Civil War. Um, my grandfather was a very highly placed official in the Tsarist administration in Moscow. Uh, before the revolution, um, uh, but you know there was no life for them after the revolution and after the civil war. You know he was cut out of his job. He, they were obviously being forced into penury, so they decided to escape back to my grandmother's hometown, which is Vilnius in Lithuania at that time. It was part of the Russian Empire, of course, at that, that period. But had, uh, after the revolution, had moved into Poland. Um, so they had a very harrowing two years escaping across Russia, caught between different armies, the white armies and the red armies of the, the uh, uh, what, uh, white Russian forces and the, and the red communist forces. Um, they were trapped in the Crimea for a while. They tried to escape that way, um, but they weren't able to board the ships that were leaving with the, with the refugees on board. Uh, so they then had to make their way back and swim across the Dniester River eventually um, with the prospect of being caught at any moment and shot. And of course, they arrived destitute inside Romania. Um, they got to safety there. And my grandmother fell very ill with scarlet fever. And they stayed with the Romanian family for six months while they recovered and then made their way slowly uh, up to my grandmother's hometown of Vilnius. So it kind of left a permanent mark on the family, I think, that whole experience, because they were completely yeah. impoverished by the revolution, uh, had to start life again. Uh, my father, in his turn, uh, had to flee Russia, had to flee Lithuania, Poland, when the Russians invaded in 1944 and came to Britain. They met my mother, who's English from Lancashire. Yeah. Uh, so I have these two strands in my family history. You know, one sort of far part which is English and very much rooted here, has been for centuries, and another part of my family which uh, crossed over from Russia to get here. Um, so it always, from when I was a child, I was fascinated by these two different strands, you know, how, why they'd come together, what had brought them together. Two families separated by nearly, well, thousands of miles who would normally never have met each other uh, had it not been for the revolution and the Civil War and the Second World War, I suppose. Um, so in a way, it's personal exploration, this yeah. book, trying to sort of understand the Anglo-Russian story, uh, which is the story in a sense of my two families, one one the British side and the other the Russian side. Why these two countries so misunderstood each other and why it all ended in a way that brought the Russian side of my family over to Britain. Um, so I've always been into, I studied history in Oxford. Um, I've always been interested in, in Russian history. I've visited Russia quite a few times. Um, I've been to all the major cities, and uh, Petersburg, and Moscow, and Ekaterinburg. I even managed to get into the house where the Tsar and his family were murdered uh, just wow. before, it was, before it was built into a cathedral. It built over it. It's now a cathedral. And I wandered around that at midnight once, uh, uh, looking at the ruins and imagining this is where it all ended, where the Romanov dynasty finally came to an end. 
So it was very important. So I think for me, it was an important quest, important journey of discovery in a sense. Yeah, and, and you, can, you can see that journey of discovery that you've gone through in your writing. Um, and you can definitely see within your little prologue about your family, you, you've really conveyed that, that horror but that desperation to get mm. across that river to safety. And it, it really brought it alive for me. And you wrote it so vividly. Uh, yes. It's really stayed with me. But the book isn't just about two places, is it? It's not just two about two families. It's about the Isle of Wight as well. Mm. So where does that angle come into it? Where does that interest stem from? Well, the book, the book is, as you say, primarily about the relationship between Britain and Russia. And that is over 300 years of Romanov rule. <clears throat> That's a big subject, you know, if you take a look at, look at it. I mean, you know, to try and look at that relationship um, uh, in a way at, at meta level, at that big level, it is quite, it's a difficult one to do. So by, in a sense, humanising it through the lens of the Isle of Wight, which became a touchstone in many ways, what, what I discovered was um, how many stories link back to the Isle of Wight in terms of the, relationship with Britain and Russia. So while one can look at the bigger story, it's often good to dip down into something a little bit more intimate. Um, why did this little island off the south of England become such an important place in many ways to reflect the wider relationship between the Romanovs and Britain over 300 years? And, you know, many people know about the, the visit of the last Tsar to the Isle of Wight, Nicholas II, in 1909. Very few know, very few people know that that relationship began as far back as Peter the Great uh, in 1698. Um, and so Russian czars over a period of three, two, 50, 250 years, 220 years, had a long and on enduring relationship um, with, that, with both Britain, but more specifically with the Isle of Wight. And I didn't think anybody had really told that story properly. People have told parts of that story um, and it, uh, but never the whole story. And it's not just the Tsars who had a link to the Isle of Wight, also Russian radicals, political exiles had a link with the Isle of Wight, um, which is also importantly part of the Russian story, the Anglo-Russian story. So in a way, it's a, it was an interesting thing to do, to take a look at the bigger Anglo-Russian relation, but also to, is in a sense, to humanize it a little, bring it down to the people and the places uh, where this occurred. And, the Isle of Wight stood out as somewhere where there had been a lot of encounters and quite significant ones. And it's it's not somewhere where the vast majority of English or British people would feel is a hub of history, is a hub of international relations. And yet alone Anglo-Russian relations, we kind of tend to see Russia as that other place. It's not quite European, but not quite in within that Asian sphere. But mm. you know, how... You know, why is the Anglo-Russian relations during this Romanov period such an interesting subject, and particularly to you as well? Yeah, yeah. Well, first of all, just to say quickly before we move on to that question, um, that the Isle of Wight uh, is not a little footnote in British history. We must remember that under Queen Victoria, it was the centre of the British Empire. And a lot of uh, important decisions were made and reached at Osborne and kings and grand dukes and British politicians and prime ministers and top writers like Charles Dickens and poets and like Tennyson, uh, famous women photographers like Julia Margaret Cameron, all flocked to the Isle of Wight. Uh, it was the place to be seen in the 19th century. Uh, you know, the center of the largest empire in the world. Um, I mean, Victoria used to spend you know, anywhere between three and four months of the year there on the Isle of Wight. Now people think of it as a rather, perhaps, you know, a small seaside uh, island where people go for holidays and uh, roam around. But we mustn't forget it was the most fashionable, the most important place in Britain for several months of the year throughout Victoria's reign. So, you know, even without the earlier connections to the Romanovs uh, coming there, Peter the Great and Tsar Alexander the First, it would have been important alone in the 19th century. Um, I mean, the German Kaisers went there, you know, the Empress of Austria used to go there, you know, all the top people went there, basically. You had um, that cow's 
that you've, you've uh, the regatta was one thing but they many of them didn't sail actually many of them went because they were near the center of power fashionable power you know they would find all the great writers and artists and politicians gathering there in the summer in the shadow osborne house um so osborne as a center of the of the british empire is a story that has not been properly told i think uh, my book tries to give it that context in the Anglo-Russian relationship. As to why Britain and the Anglo-Russian story is interesting, is you're right. Russia is a country a long way from Britain, um, but yet Britain found itself as its empire expanded and its commercial and political and military interests expanded, coming up against a rising Russia. You know, Russia broke out into the Baltic and became a European naval power with the help of English shipbuilders from Cowes. It's not often forgotten that Peter the Great's fleet was built by English shipbuilders from Cowes in Deptford. Um, so Russia then became a European power. Now, once it became a European power in the early 18th century, it banged up against England, against Britain, who was also a rising power in Europe at that time. Uh, thereafter, their interests coincided all over the world, in, in Central Asia, in Persia, Tibet, over India. So Russia was a very significant um, country of concern to Britain. And then, of course, um, you know, in the 19th century, the rise of Russian literature, art, music, Tolstoy, Tchaikovsky, Borodin, all these influenced the British public in huge ways. In, in return, the British were investing in Russia in big ways, building railways, building factories, industries, it was the El Dorado uh, for Britain, you know, uh, a new mecca of wealth and opportunity and industry for British manufacturers. So by the mid 19th century, Britain and Russia were inextricably linked at every level. Um, so the Anglo-Russian relationship was very important um, to Britain and to Russia and continues to be so today. I mean, you know, the my argument is, uh, Jackson, that the um, you know, the pattern of that relationship, of the current relationship today between Britain and Russia, was largely laid, the foundations of it were laid during the Romanov period. And the kinds of the tensions, problems, uh, successes in the relationship, which we mark today, um, were, are all based, I think, on those patterns that were set to 100 and 200 years ago, 300 years ago, during the Romanov Russia period. So this is why the story, in my view, is so interesting, because, you know, many people are puzzled by, aren't they, by today's difficult relationship with Russia in many ways. I don't see it as being atypical of the relationship we have with Russia all the time uh, over the last two or three hundred years. There's no difference between Soviet Russia or post-Soviet Russia and Romanov Russia in the sense of the relation with Britain. We are locked in the same pattern of behaviour with each other. Yeah. And we're we're also locked into a, into a relationship with Russia and many other di different ways as well. Uh, you know, beyond socially, economically, we were bound by royal families. We were bound by marriage. Uh, and this, whilst it wasn't always bound by marriage, this relationship, you know, we've seen it ebb and flow. It's been tense yes. and it's been great. But why has it ebbed and flowed? Why has it changed? Um, and what's, what's really been the cause of that? Yes, yeah, it's very interesting. I mean, I think, um, is it Churchill who once famously described the relationship with Russia or described Russia as an enigma uh, wrapped in a mystery inside um, a riddle or words to that effect, you know. Yeah, away with words, didn't they? And <laughs> to the Russians, Britain has also been um, a country which they don't fully get or understand. I think there's been a lot of uh, misunderstandings between Britain and Russia. The ebb and flow, as you describe it, is a very interesting one. We've needed each other as two countries. We've been allies in wars much more than we've been enemies, paradoxically. Um, you know, we fought the French, the Germans, the Spanish, far more times than we fought the Russians. I mean, generally, the Russians have been our allies, whether it's in the Napoleonic War, in the First World War, in the Second World War, there's only one time that Britain and Russia had gone to war with each other directly, a land war with each other, that was the Crimea. 
Um, we've had periods of great mistrust, obviously, over Asia and over India, but it didn't result in any major wars, interestingly enough. Um, but it, for some reason, despite all that, um, there have not been many periods in the Anglo-Russian relationship when we've really trusted each other. There's been a great deal of suspicion and mistrust between the two countries, but really between the two governments. I think actually at a people-to-people -people level, um, Russians and British people have got on quite well and have had a great respect for one another in terms of art and culture and literature. And, you know, Russians love everything about Britain and its art and culture and history and literature. British people, I think, are fascinated by Russian music, Russian ballet, uh, great figures of Russian literature, you know, are well known in this country. So at that level, Britain and Russia have had a very positive relationship. But at a government to government level, despite the marriage between the royal families and the, in, in, in the marriage between the royal families, it hasn't worked very well. No. Uh, there was a you know, brief period under Peter the Great when it was sort of worked for a while, uh, and then a brief period under as I, Alexander I during the Napoleonic Wars. And then we enter a whole 19th century of mistrust, culminating in the Crimean War in the 1850s. Yeah, and I don't. You things changed till 1907, till the Anglo-Russian Convention. Well, two, two defining features I think I found of that later relationship within your work was the, the great balancing act across Europe with the Triple Entente, trying to maintain Germany or keep Germany down. And the second one has gone off the top of my head, but um, definitely that the Triple Entente and trying to maintain that whole balance of power across across Europe, I found really interesting. You really brought it to life. Do you mind mm. telling us some more about that that balancing of power? Yes. I mean, this is um, a very interesting development because Russia and Britain after the Crimean War in the 1850s, um, there was a very uneasy relationship between the two countries. And Russia at that time was linked to Germany much more. The, the Russian-German relationship was much more powerful. Russia began to edge away from Germany in the 1890s, 1880, late 1880s. They began to sort of, sort of get uneasy about, the, particularly after 1871, after the unification of Germany and Bismarck and coming to power. Russia and Germany were less friendly and began to sort of edge away. And, and Russia began to edge towards France a lot more and seeing France as a counterbalance to Germany. In, Britain came into this new relationship quite late um, I mean, for a long time, Britain, um, in a way, saw its role. It didn't enter into the Franco-Prussian War. It, it, it kept itself outside Europe, I mean, to, to a large degree. But increasingly, it began to get uneasy about the rising power of Germany. And, and German military and naval might began to worry Britain. But it wasn't till, not till the reign of King Edward VII from Tsar Nicholas II in, 19, you know, in the early 20th century that Britain and Russia really began to think about having an alliance. As late as 1904, Britain and Russia nearly went to war. There was a um, incident at the Dogger Bank where during the uh, Russian-Japanese War of, of 1904-05, when Ru the Russian Baltic fleet on its way to the Pacific to fight the, the, the Japanese, fired on English fishing boats in the Dogger Bank uh, and killed several British fishermen, mistaking them for Japanese warships. I don't know why they thought the Germans had got that close to, you know, <laughs> to the Baltic, but um, this caused huge outright outrage in Britain. And the British fleet was mobilised, and, and, there were, and, it was, and had it not been for the very clever intervention of the Russian ambassador Alexander Benkendorf um, and King Edward, uh, who we rightly call the peacemaker in many ways, Edward the Seventh, uh, there could have been a war at that point in Britain and Russia. Um, Russia was suspicious of Britain's support for Japan, its covert support for Japan. But anyway, we stepped back from that war and three years later signed the Anglo-Russian Convention of 1907, which was an amazing deal. I mean, it didn't cover, it wasn't a, a, a treaty, a military treaty in Europe in that sense. It was a convention, a treaty that we would not, uh, we would respect each other's spheres of influence in Central Asia, Persia, and Afghanistan and Tibet. But this took the pressure 
off the Indian Empire, the British Indian Empire. One of the great fears of the British all the time in the 19th century was the Russians wanted to invade India. Um, so that was lifted. Once that was kind of that pressure was lifted, um, Britain could look around a bit more. And Edward VII had struck the Entente Cordiale with France. And therefore, France was an ally of Russia. And so Edward launched personally almost a, a peace initiative with Russia, which led to the Anglo Russian Convention. In uh, 1908, he made the first ever visit by a British reigning monarch to um, Russia. Uh, and in 1909, they invited the Tsar back to set the seal on the, what you might call the Triple Entente. Um, it wasn't a military pact it, in any sense, so it didn't involve Britain actually committing itself to fighting if Russia was attacked or France was attacked by Germany. Um, but uh, uh, the basic uh, um, outline, you might say, of the First World War alliances was set because Germany reacted very nervously to this new alliance, this new triple entente between Russia, France and Britain, and of course established its own uh, great powers alliance with Austria-Hungary and Italy as a counterbalance. So already then have the kind of uh, framework that would lead to the First World War. Um, so yes, I mean, I think Britain began to realize that Germany was a threat and that Russia was less of a threat, paradoxically. And once they'd settled the tensions over Central Asia and India, you know, Britain was not so worried about Russia in Europe. I mean, they weren't, didn't see Russia as a threat to British interests in Europe, but they saw Germany as a threat to British interests in Europe. So it was natural, therefore, to go in with this treaty. So I call that treaty was groundbreaking, actually. And for 10 years, Britain and Russia were close allies through the First World War, right up to the revolution of 1917, which brought an end, I think, to the... Um, the alliance between Britain and Russia and France um, at that point. Yeah. Well, it's it's really interesting to see that, you know, that changing of relationships play out. But also at the same time, you're seeing a a political oh dear, a uh, political change within both countries where Britain is starting mm -hmm. to grow to become more liberal um, and attracting Russian political expats are escaping the growing authoritarianism of Russia. Now, how did, how did both countries see that changing political or political evolution of each other? How did they see that? And how did the, Russia, the royal families see or perceive that growing liberalism or growing authoritarianism? Yes, I mean, it's uh, a, you know, a very complex picture. But Russia itself was evolving in, as well towards a more liberal structures, particularly after the 1905 revolution, when the debt, the Duma was instituted and there was a more liberal approach to media freedom, press freedom and so forth. But you're right that in the 1850s, with the reign of um, Nicholas I, our Nicholas I, uh, there was a, a, a quite a severe autocracy. Um, Nicholas rejected completely the um, you might call aristocratic liberalism of his bro elder brother, Tsar Alexander I. Um, although no way was Alexander particularly liberal, but he, but he had sympathies at least a bit towards a more liberal approach to things like freedom of religion and, and a slightly more sort of uh, uh, indulgent approach to the aristocracy, the liberal aristocracy in Russia. Censorship was a bit lighter in his time. Um, but Nicholas, his brother, when he succeeded to the throne, decided that he had to restore the power of Russian autocracy, nationalism, and orthodoxy. And this was the sort of the three, the three sort of pillars upon which Russia, Imperial Russia, would be built. So starting in the 1850s, you're right, there was, um, or even the 1840s, um, as soon as Nicholas really got to the throne, this became an issue. He succeeded in 1825. A um, lot of Russian uh, intellectuals, radical political radicals, others liberals, did start to leave Russia and move over to Western Europe. Many of them went to Paris, but a large contingent established themselves in London, um, amongst whom were people like Alexander Hertz. Uh, later on, you've got people like Prince Kropotkin coming over. Um, so you had, you know, a group of... of um, political radicals based in Britain, 
throughout, and, the, and this community grew uh, throughout the 19th century, even when, um, uh, after Nicholas's death, Tsar Alexander II came in, and he was more liberal. So you see, Russia went in fits and starts of liberalism and autocracy, kept switching backwards and forwards. Meanwhile, you know, so it wasn't a consistent picture of autocracy. There were periods of greater freedom and liberalism inside Russia uh, as well. That kind of ended when Alexander II was murdered and Alexander III came to assassinated in 1881 by uh, Russian anarchists. And they, in 1881, Tsar Alexander III came to the throne and he was more like Nicholas. He was more in favor of autocracy and the Orthodox Church. And that. you had another wave uh, coming over to Britain. Uh, and those included particularly a lot of Jews, Russian Jews, because pogroms were, were starting. Now in Britain at the same time, you know, there was an increasing liberalization, more democracy, as you say, and um, British people began to, you know, in a sense, they felt um, that Britain was the home of freedom and tolerance and so forth. They didn't like many of them, what they saw going on in Russia, particularly under Alexander III, with the anti-Jewish pogroms and so forth. Now, the, so they did welcome or tolerate for a while a lot of Russian refugees coming in, so long as they behave themselves. Uh, <laughs> yeah, this was the issue. With the, British. <laughs> the British viewpoint, which is still a position today, I think, is that we accept political refugees so long as they don't cause trouble for us in this country. They can get on and do what they want, you know, um, and that has caused problems in Britain, of course, as we know in more recent times. Um, and again, in, in that period, it caused some trouble because, of course, into that mix of Russian emigres and refugees did come criminal elements and terrorist elements. And um, there were, starting in the 20th century, a number of Russian anarchist terrorist attacks inside Britain itself, which upset relations in Britain and Russia at that period. To the Russians, it was incomprehensible why Britain which was supposedly a friend of Russia, and the monarchy was, could allow these people to operate inside Britain. You know, if you're my friend, you're my ally, or you're my, why are you allowing people who don't like our government to operate there? And the British perspective was, well, we like to tolerate people who have different views. Uh, but the Russians, if this was completely, uh, you know, beyond, you know, the, the boundaries really of understanding, they said, you know, you should send these people back to Russia. What are you doing letting them operate like this? And the British said, well, oh, they're not creating any problems. We're not going to do anything <laughs> about them, you know. And of course, many of these radicals had a lot of friends and sympathizers in Britain. So the Russians then began to infiltrate um, British emigres, Russian emigre circles inside Britain. The Russian secret police, the Okhrana, you know, had secret agents operating in Britain trying to disrupt Russian emigre circles and cause problems between them and their British hosts, you know, in order to discredit them. And uh, you have extraordinary stories where people are operating as double agents, you know, they're operating for the Tsar, and they were also revolutionaries. So they were kind of, you know, Evno Aznev was one of the most famous until he was exposed, you know, he was carrying out terrorist attacks inside Russia, but he was also feeding information back to the Tsarist secret police uh, about his networks. Eventually, was, his cover was blown. Um, so it, it, this was creating a real problem, actually, this mixing of criminality, of secret police, of refugees. And it all blew up spectacularly in 1909, just for the Tsar's visit with the uh, famous Tottenham outrage, where Russian anarchists uh, attacked a tram. Um, two people, including a boy of 10, were killed and 25 others seriously injured. And this seemed to a lot of British people to just represent, you know, everything had gone haywire in the Russian emigre community. What were they doing here? Which is exactly in the way what the Russian authorities wanted, that kind of reaction. Um, you know, they discredit those emigres as far as they could. I think the probably the biggest representation of that is Lenin spent time in London as well, who yeah. would yeah. later go on to be, as many people know, a massive problem for the Romanovs. Yeah. Um, well, Lenin, Lenin was chased out of Belgium, out of Brussels, by the Belgian police. Um, I mean, the Belgians put the, the screw on him, basically, and he and his supporters had to get out, and they came to London, because London was seen to be um, a safe place for radical political exiles 
And they held their famous meeting in the Three Johns pub in Islington, you know, where the great split happened between the Mensheviks and the Bolsheviks. And uh, really the founding, in, in a sense, of the, of the Bolshevik party took place in a pub in, in London, you know, uh, under the watchful eyes of the, of the British security services, but they didn't do anything about it. They weren't going to do anything. Um, and then moving right down onto the Isle of Wight, these radicals, they, they did move down to Ventnor. Yes. Uh, as you mentioned in your book. And why, they, why, why did they do that? What, what, what was in it for them to move down to the Isle of Wight? And why, why Ventnor? Yes. Well, it's very interesting. I mean, you know, uh, Isle of Wight became, as I said, very fashionable for people. And whereas Cowes was where the, what you might say was the imperial and royal center of the island. You had Queen Victoria sitting in Osborne House. You had all these kings and czars and grand dukes calling on her there and all that sort of thing. So it wouldn't have attracted any radicals to go there, I don't think, you know. <laughs> um, but Venda always had a reputation, a growing reputation uh, for being a, a, a an alternative centre. British radicals had gone there. You know, there were chartists, there were others who'd gone there in the 1830s and 40s. So, and then it was a, considered to be a rather remote town. It was difficult to get to. You must remember in those days, um, you know, the Isle of Wight wasn't that as well connected up as it is now. So traveling there by stagecoach in the early days across fairly sort of hilly roads and things. So they felt a lot of radicals, the Hungarian radicals, those, those were Leos Kossuth, who led the um, rebellion against the Habsburgs. He went there first of all um, uh, in the 1840s, late uh, early 50s. Um, and he was a great friend of Alexander Herzen. And he invited Herzen to come to Ventnor. Uh, and Herzen, Alexander Herzen, really was a giant in the Russian exile community, radical community. So where Herzen goes, others followed. And Herzen sort of holidayed in Ventnor for several summers. He rented a villa on the seafront and he attracted around him um, a salon um, of very radical Russians who were in London came down to spend summers in Ventnor by the sea with Herzen. So you had all sorts of, you had Malvina von Meissenberg, who was one of the first uh, feminists, I would say. You had all sorts of um, uh, Princess Leonelia Bariatinsky, you know, a very radical chic aristocrat who was sort of anti-Romanov or to some degree against the, the, the Zara system at that time. You had all sorts of others coming down. You had the memorialist Pavel Arankov came down. You had Ogyarev, another sort of radical Russian. You had people like Nicholas Cruz, the former censor of St. Petersburg, who had um, uh, been uh, expelled for, <laughs> by the Tsars for not censoring a single book. <laughs> you know, he, he came to Ventnor. You had other radicals there um, pitching up. You know, eventually, of course, Marx found his way there uh, in the 1880s. They're not, he wasn't Russian. Um, so Ventnor became this, this uh, very attractive town for Russian radicals. And of course, the most famous, Turgenev, Ivan Turgenev, the author of Fathers and Sons, spent a summer down there. Um, but he was not, in, in any sense, a, a, a radical politician, but the book he wrote became a very radical manifesto in a sense that was fathers and sons which created the figure of Bazarov, Yevgeny Bazarov, the nihilist which kind of went on to inspire a whole generation of young Russians in the sort of futility of everything and then in fact a nihilist terror across Russia and again it was appalled that Bazarov should have had become that kind of figure but he did <laughs> um, so you know, uh, you have this very interesting place where at one period of time, between about 1860 and 1865, probably, the majority of people going to Ventnor were Russians. Um, so much so that Herzen stopped going there. He said, I, I'm fed up with being surrounded by Russians. He said, I'm going to Bournemouth instead for my holidays. <laughs> he, he abandoned Ventnor, actually, because there were too many Russians there. And he was slightly uneasy because he began to think, you know, if there are so many Russians here, there could be secret agents of the Tsar watching us. You know, the more Russians were coming in, you couldn't kind of monitor them all. You couldn't be sure of them all. And he was quite suspicious of a number of the people who pitched up 
claiming to be radicals in one form or another, whether in fact they were double agents then set there. So he kind of decided to move back onto the mainland again. But other Russians continued going there. Uh, and so for that brief period, probably about lasted about 10, 15 years, Ventnor was very passionate about Russian radicals uh, that period. I, de- I definitely wouldn't be be risking it like he did there with all the possible secret agents. So probably Bournemouth <laughs> was the safer option for him. <laughs> yes, because he was well known as, as the le- one of the leading critics of the Romanov regime. Yes, uh, time, time to save your skin. <laughs> yeah, and described as, you know, the father of Russian socialism. He was also um, the founder of the Russian Free Press in London. And, of course, he published the, one of the great radical magazines, The Bell, the journal The Bell, um, which circulated widely inside Russia itself. I mean, even Tsar Alexander is supposed to have read it and been rather influenced by some of its thinking. You know, and, and they say that um, the, the, the abolition of serfdom, in 1861, may have been partly influenced by Herzen's writings against serfdom. Um, so it was a, an interesting intellectual centre um, of radical alternative Russia flourishing, only 14 miles from cows with its imperial kind of associations and uh, links and so forth. And, you know, in a funny sort of way, for a period of time, there was Russia scaled down to the Isle of Wight every summer. <laughs> Russian Grand Duke sounds coming to cows or czars and then radicals beetling off to, to Ventnor on the southeast coast. It really is an interesting cross section of yeah. uh, society at that point. But now yeah. we've, we've heard why the Isle of Wight is important to radicals, why it's important to the British royal family. Mm. Um, before we touch on why the Isle of Wight was important to the Romanovs, I kind of want to touch on why the Isle of Wight is important. There's so many things going off in the Isle of Wight. You have the, the shipbuilding, you have Cow's Week, you have Osborne House. But firstly, mm. we'll stick we'll start at the the beginning of your, your book with the shipbuilding. You know, yeah. why is the shipbuilding so important and why is British ship shipbuilding from the Isle of Wight so highly thought of in that yes. early period? Yeah, I mean the Isle of Wight, East Cows. Um, became a significant shipbuilding center in the 17th century. And there was a man called Joseph Nye, NYE, who established or uh, what's called Nye's Yard in East Cowles, one of the first shipbuilding centers. I mean, the, the history of ships and shipbuilding on the Isle of Wight goes back to time of Henry VIII. Um, I mean, you know, the Solent was an important area for the British the English fleet. Uh, you had the Mary Rose and other, other flagships. They were not built in the Isle of Wight, they were built in Portsmouth, but they were all sailing around there and there was shipbuilding going on on the Isle of Wight. But gradually, I mean, the major shipyard that emerged was Joseph Nye's shipyard in the, in the 17th century. And they built a lot of ship, English ships for the Navy at that time. Um, uh, uh, ships like the Britannia and others were, were built in Nye's yard. Um, so there was a good tradition of shipbuilding. Now, Nye himself, when the Tsar came, Tsar Peter the Great came to England in 1698 as a guest of William III, um, he went down to Portsmouth and he went sailing in the Solent off the Isle of Wight. And he saw the English fleet at anchor in the, in the roads, in the spithead, uh, between the Isle of Wight and, and the mainland. And he was bowled over by this fleet and decided that he would like something similar to Russia. And Nye, Joseph Nye heard about his, his trip down and so forth and decided to go up to London to call on him. And he presented himself as the Isle of Wight shipbuilder and sort of indicated that all those ships didn't kind of say they'd been built in the Isle of Wight, but he said that many of them had been. And so Peter the Great said, well, will you come back with me to Russia and help me build a fleet? And Joseph Nye agreed. And he went back to Russia with him. And over a period of about 25 years, they built the Russian Baltic fleet, which originally only had one ship. And eventually by the, uh, by the 1720s had 140 warships and 400 galleys. And Nye recruited a lot of shipbuilders from Portsmouth, Deptford and the Isle of Wight to uh, come and work with him. Um, so, 
what I began when I said earlier was that the breakthrough of Russia as a European naval power began with, with a ship built in the Isle of Wight going over and Peter the Great. Now, Peter the Great, um, the, he and I had a very close friendship. They would go everywhere together. They would have wild drinking sessions together. They would write to each other every day if they were apart. It was a real friendship. I mean, not just a sort of czar and a shipbuilder. They were really good friends. Uh, eventually, in, in 1719, the British Parliament decided enough was enough. But they were very alarmed by the rising power of, Ru of Russia's navy. And they demanded, passed an act of Parliament which said that all English shipbuilders should return immediately, including Joseph and I in that request. And that there are no more shipbuilders from Isle of Wight or Portsmouth or Deptford could be allowed to go to Russia. In other words, they wanted to cut off the, the, the British, the English support to the Tsar's fleet. So Nye was summoned in by the Tsar, who said, you know, well, you've got there's a request here for you to return to England. And uh, Nye said, I don't want to go back to England. I want to stay with you and carry on this work, important work. So the Tsar said, for, for that, he said, I'm making you a nobleman, made him a nobleman. Um, and uh, at Tsar Peter the Great's death in 1725, he was one of the pallbearers carrying the coffin of Tsar Peter the Great. So there you have this extraordinary story of this Isle of Wight shipbuilder who had traveled all the way to Russia and built the Russian Baltic fleet, which eventually dominated the Baltic, drove the Swedes, broke the power of the Swedes in the Baltic, and allow Russia to become a major naval power. Um, so that was the first connection, in a way, with the Isle of Wight um, for Russia and for the Tsars, um, which I think is a very important one and not a story that's not often uh, understood. Uh, you could say that you know, an Isle of Wight shipbuilder helped create Russia as a European power. So they really are intrinsically linked really I, I think i think without that navy without the defeat of sweden and the baltic russia would never have made a breakthrough uh, uh, to become a european power because while sweden dominated the baltic russia would have been confined to the white sea and and the black sea as its sort of areas it wouldn't have had an access to the baltic the swedes would have controlled everything and stopped the russians after that point russia broke the power of sweden and the baltic um, due to its large fleet. It wasn't just its land forces. I mean, there was a major defeat of Sweden, of course, at the Battle of Poltava in 1712 with Charles XII. But that alone would not have been enough to break broken Swedish supremacy. You must forget, mustn't forget that Sweden was a major imperial power at this point. We're not used to thinking of Sweden in that kind of way today. We see it as a small to medium-sized European country, which keeps itself to itself largely in terms of, but it was one of the great European powers, had been throughout the 17th century. You know, the Swedish empire in Europe extended all the way down into Poland and, and far down towards the Black Sea, and there were Swedish armies on the, on the rampage. So um, the defeat of, of Sweden by Peter the Great was greatly abetted by the rise of its, the building of its fleet, which we must say, Joseph and I played a very critical part in. And then moving forward, you know, that shipbuilding is still important, but the the shipbuilding on the Isle of Wight's kind of changed in its nature and it's moved towards, you know, that cow's week. Uh, and yeah, that cow's week. yachting and all that sort of thing. I mean, you know, there were, I mean, the East Cows remains quite an important um, industrial shipbuilding centre. I mean, you know, they moved, they moved into hovercrafts, they moved into... Uh, they had small light shipping, cruisers, defense things throughout the twenties. And Joseph Nye's yard was replaced by J.S. Samuel White, which was a very important naval um, shipbuilder for many years. Only, only I think, only um, folded in the 1960s. Um, but still today, East Cows is, is a center. Um, and, and a lot of it is yachting, smaller ships and vessels and so forth. And of course, in 1846, they built the first Russian imperial yacht at East Cows. Uh, it was commissioned by Queen Victoria, named after her, and built the Tsar Nicholas I. Uh, that set the standard for Russia, all future Russian imperial yachts. Um, and that was launched in Cows, in East Cows, in 1847. Um, so there was a, a kind of link there. And then, you know, the, 
the famous Cow's Regatta of 1909 was the opportunity to invite the Tsar over to Britain um, for what became, I think, the high point in Anglo-Russian relations. And the Tsar's visit to Cow's was not just a pleasure trip or, a, or an excuse to go on a yachting on the, on, the, on the Solent, which they did, of course. It was a serious business of actually setting the seal and celebrating the new Anglo-Russian convention, the new treaty between Russia and Britain. And you uh, you present the Royal Yacht Squadron as this this British diplomatic tool, yeah. Um, you know, of presenting membership uh, and titles onto Nicholas. Yeah. Uh, do you, you know, I've, I've obviously read that from the text, but how important of a an international diplomatic tool was membership to the Royal? Uh, Royal Yacht well, Squadron. The Royal Yacht Squadron was and still is probably the most prestigious uh, yachting club in the world um, and one of the oldest. Um, founded originally in East Cows, it moved over to West Cows uh, in the 1850s um, to the where its present occupies its present building, which was the former West Cows Castle. Uh, you can not only be invited to become a member, you can't apply to be invited of course you know it tends it was then certainly and still today a very a very um, prestigious high-ranking kind of individuals who were invited to become members so the first czar to be invited was nicholas I, following his visit state visit to britain in 1844 um, he was then invited to become a member of the royal yacht squadron he was uh, queen victoria commissioned the royal yacht uh, queen victoria to be built for him and so forth. Uh, he cancelled his membership of the Royal Yacht Squadron during, when the Crimean War broke out because he was very upset to hear that yachts from the Royal Yacht Squadron had been uh, ferrying supplies to the British troops in the Crimea. And there were several yachts from the Royal Yacht Squadron were commandeered um, because at time of war, all the yachts, that's why it's called the Squadron, all the yachts in the, in the, in the Royal Yacht Squadron are eligible to be taken over and used by the Navy for military naval purposes. Uh, they're all available in ships to be used. And so the um, Royal Yacht Squadron provided quite a few yachts that sailed off to the Crimea laden with sort of all sorts of goodies for British troops. Yeah. And when Tsar Nicholas heard this, he was terribly upset. He thought it was, you know, how can I be a member of a club which is sending boats to fight against my troops, to help the troops fight against me? So he cancelled his membership. Tsar, um, his son, though, the Grand Duke Constantine, uh, made a visit to the Isle of Wight in 1847. Uh, he was offered membership of the club. Uh, and he, uh, he, by the way, was the great grandfather of Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, which is interesting, who became later the Duke of Edinburgh, became the Admiral of the Squadron later on. So uh, there, there he was, a nice connection between. Philip Duke of Edinburgh having a great grandfather who was a Romanov uh, Grand Duke, and he himself then becoming an admiral of the squadron. Um, and he he was an active sailor in a yacht. He never resigned despite the Crimean War. Uh, he kept his membership going uh, right through the 19th century. And then, of course, Tsar Nicholas comes on the scene, Tsar Nicholas II. And, you know, this was felt to be an important gesture to offer him membership. He wasn't, Nicholas wasn't a sailor. He didn't actually sail himself very much. I mean, he went out on his yachts, right, the Standard, the Imperial Yacht Standard. But I mean, he didn't go sailing particularly, but he was very happy and very honoured to accept this invitation to become a member of the Royal, the Royal Yacht Squadron. And he remained a member right up to his death in 1918. Um, so yes, it was a, it wasn't quite a significant way of, you know, in a way, tying in or offering something of, of prestige and status to a visiting Russian Tsar to become a member of the Royal Yacht Squadron in Cows. Um, uh, when um, Nicholas visited the Cows Week, uh, they had a special dinner on board the uh, King Edward's yacht, the Victoria and Albert, in which all the members of the Royal Yacht Squadron, the senior officials and everything, came on board and. Uh, presented, you know, his honour to him. He was now a member. They had a dinner, a special dinner commission for him in that, in honour of that. And then, you know, he's he's taken this membership on and he's come to the Isle of Wight because obviously it's an important place to him uh, and especially his wife. 
and the name of this ship uh, king edward ship victoria and albert kind of relates to why the island is so important mm. to the romanovs particularly uh nicholas and alexandra but you know can you enlighten us on why this this island is so important to the last of the czars the last of the romanovs well you know um the tsarina alexandra um, previously Alex of Hesse, when she married Nicholas in 1894, um, had been brought and spent a lot of time on the island. She, her mother, Princess Alice, who was a daughter of Queen Victoria, had died young in 1878 of diphtheria. And therefore Queen Victoria took the, yeah, the children, her children, Princess Alice's children, under her wing. Uh, another of the uh, of the children of the sister of the Tsarina Alexandra was the Grand Duchess, future Grand Duchess Elizabeth Romanov, who married into the Romanov family as well. Um, so the on that side, on that, that that family had spent a lot of time when they were young at Osborne. So for the Tsarina, this was returning to a place that she knew extremely well. She was um, had had many happy years there with her grandmother. Um, her grandmother, you know, felt very um, protective of Alex of Hesse. And she sensed there was something a little bit melancholic about her. I mean, she worried about her a lot, more than she did about her other grandchildren. In fact, Victoria didn't want her to marry Nicholas, the future Tsar Nicholas. Um, she felt the Romanov throne was shaky and dangerous, dangerous throne. And uh, she, for a while, resisted the the, the plans for the two of them to marry. But in the end, she was won over. Nicholas was a charming man, young man, in many ways. Um, he himself was wary of the Queen, as all the Romanov. The Romanov relationship with Queen Victoria was a problematic one. There was a lot of mistrust between them at a personal level. It wasn't just at a government to government level, it was also at a personal level. Victoria did not entirely trust the Romanovs. Um, and he, for his part, described her as a round ball on shaky legs. That was his own description <laughs> of her. So he was kind of slightly wary of her. For him, the Isle of Wight, of course, you know, he'd been there twice. He'd been there as a child with his parents. And he knew of its connections to the Romanovs. He was aware of the links. He, his aunt, um, the Grand Duchess Maria, um, had married into the British royal family and spent a lot of time on the Isle of Wight. She was a sister of his father. She married Prince um, Alfred of Edinburgh and uh, spent many summers there on the Isle of Wight. Um, so Nicholas grew up and his, his parents had visited there when he was a child and taken him and so forth. So he grew up with the knowledge of, of Queen Victoria, of Osborne, of the sort of family links there and the to, to these cows and so forth. So for him, it was a, f a familiar place, although, you know, they didn't, he did not visit there that often. He visited three times in his life. Um, so not exactly like the Tsarina, but the Isle of Wight, because it occupied a special place in the British royal family, the, the Russian royal family were fully aware of it and knew its importance. Um, and uh, that's why they were very happy to have the meeting then. But, you know, there was another reason they met in the Isle of Wight, because it was safe. Um, it was not safe for them to have gone to London. Um, Russian terrorist attacks, anarchist attacks in London, uh, were part of the landscape now. So that, therefore, you know, British security and Russian security decided it was safer to have them at sea off the Isle of Wight. And they, though they went ashore at the Isle of Wight on that final visit, they never slept on, on shore. Um, Russian security services covered the island on that visit, uh, dressed as yachtsmen, many of them. Um, they were positioned at street corners and everywhere. So there was a huge security ring thrown around the Tsar and the Tsarina on that visit to the, to, to the Isle of Wight. Um, so you know, there were family reasons to go back there, but there were also important security reasons why they went back. Okay. And for me personally, this is my, my favourite part of the book in terms of your writing. You've, you've built up very quickly to kind of speed up towards the death of the, death of the Romanovs but from this, from this week that they spent in the Isle of Wight, mm. 
for me, it felt like you slowed it right down to show that, you know, this was, this was the beginning. This was the beginning of the end of this family. And, you know, it was very, it was a very emotional way of writing. And I really enjoyed, you know, feeling, you know, not only reading it, but feeling, you know, that yeah. move towards their demise. And um, so do you mind, do you mind enlightening us on, you know, how that end came to be? Yes. Well, um, I mean, we know about the, the revolution of March, February, March, 1917, which overthrew the Romanovs and um, Nicholas abdicated. Um, Russia was in chaos at that time. The, you know, it all started with the Women's March for Bread. It hadn't started in any way as a, as a Bolshevik revolution or anything like that, it came much later. It initially started as a, on Women's Day, 1917, Women, International Women's Day, a march of St. Petersburg women asking for bread because there was a terrible shortage of food because everything was being uh, going to the front, the, the military front at that time. The Tsar was at the front, and the Tsarina was back in Petersburg trying to run things, at, uh, you know, uh, not very successfully and, and rather unpopularly. You know, of course, she, she had Rasputin as an advisor who was very unpopular with a lot of the Russian public um, and even with the, within the Romanov family. Um, so this started, and, and then of course, that you know, students began to join, workers began to join. Eventually there were strikes all over St. Petersburg and spreading to Moscow and other places like that. It was a bit of a rerun of the 1905 revolution, but with Russia in chaos because of the First World War and, and, and you know, there was no ability to be able to control things. Um, the Tsar decided to try and get back to Petersburg to sort of rally his troops, his loyal troops and so on, and his train was stopped a uh, place called Pskov, you know, uh, quite a few hundred miles from Petersburg. He was cut off there and uh, put under pressure, really, to resign. He, you know, eventually decided he'd step down from the throne and um, for the sake of his family and so forth and hand over to his brother, his younger brother, Michael, Grand Duke Michael. Um, but within 24 hours, Michael had basically said he wouldn't accept, he, he wouldn't really take on the offer of the throne. And it was agreed that there would be a provisional government and that provisional government um, would hold free elections um, and, and there would be a constituent assembly and the constituent assembly would decide on what form of government Russia should have for the future. And it might well be a monarchy, you know, um, but no one could foresee till they'd have the election, the constituent assembly and decide then and debate what would suit Russia best. So the provisional government lasted all the way through the summer, 1917, and of course Alexander Kerensky, you know, became the uh, prime minister of the government and so forth. They realised the current the provisional government early on that the Tsar was at risk. He got back to Petersburg. He was with his family at Zarkiv Selo, just outside Petersburg. But the, the Tsar's family were at risk because there was a growing kind of anti-Tsarist mood around, you know. They tried to get them out and they, they made an approach to Britain, to the British government. And they said, would the British government accept the Romanovs? It could be taken to Port Romanov, present, present day Romansk uh, in Northern Russia, and from there taken by British ship, warship to Britain. So the plan was to offer them asylum in Britain. And Britain accepted that. Lloyd George, the prime minister, um, consulted with the king, George V, who was the cousin member of Tsar Nicholas, and they said, yes, we'll do that, we'll accept them. But within five days or six days, they revoked that decision, uh, that offer. And that was largely at the request of King George V, who was under pressure from his personal advisor, Lord Stamfordham, who said, you know, if you accept the Romanovs, your own throne, might be in danger because people would uh, possibly foment a revolution here against you for having accepted Tsar Nicholas, who many of them think of as a tyrant, who we should never have supported. I personally don't think there would have, that, there would have been that danger um, because Russia had been an ally, Nicholas had been an ally of Britain. There would have been some rumblings and some discontent, but I think most people would have said, okay, they're in danger. We'll take them so long as they don't, you know, just keep a quiet private life somewhere in England. Uh, so by the time the uh, offer was rescinded, it was too late 
for Nicholas and his family to have escaped Petersburg, because by then, Bolshevik army units had cut the railway lines out of Petersburg. So the Tsarist government, the, the provisional government, decided then to move them to Siberia, to Tobolsk, uh, a town right in the, in, the, in the depths of Siberia, where they thought they'd be safe from all the troubles in, in uh, Moscow and St. Petersburg. So they were taken there to a, a house there, and they lived there right through the winter of 1917. Of course, then the Bolshevik revolution happened in October, November 1917. Lenin came to power. Once that happened, the Tsar's fate was sealed because these Lenin uh, and the Bolsheviks were not going to allow the Tsar to travel freely back to the West. They, they were worried that he would become a rallying point or his children or his family for the white Russian forces, the pro-Tsarist forces. So they were, we don't quite know what was going on, but they were taken from Tobolsk, um, supposedly to Moscow, um, maybe to stand trial, as I was going to stand trial. But on the way, they were intercepted by um, uh, Soviet uh, or Bolshevik um, forces from Ekaterinburg which was a very strongly Bolshevik town in, in the Urals. And the, the Ekaterinburg Soviet took them, hijacked, stopped the train and took them to, diverted it to Ekaterinburg. And they were then taken to the house of a merchant called Epatiev, a small villa in the town, around which was a wooden palisade was created. The windows were whitewashed out. They were held there. Um, until July 1918, when white Russian armies, Czech uh, forces were working with the white armies, the pro-monarchist, pro pro-anti-Bolshevik uh, anti forces, they weren't necessarily always pro-monarchist, but they were anti-Bolshevik forces, were within reach of Ekaterinburg. A decision was taken by the Ekaterinburg Soviet and Lenin and Sverdlov in Moscow that the whole royal family had to be eliminated there was a risk they would fall into the hands of the uh, whites, the white armies who were just a couple of days away. Um, so they were all murdered on the night of the 16th and 17th of July, 1918. And their bodies not really discovered, you know, till um, over 70 years later, uh, when they were exhumed and DNA tested and now buried in St. Petersburg, the Pekin Port Fortress in St. Petersburg. So it was a tragic end. You know, whether, whether if the British had maintained their offer of asylum, the Tsar would have got out, I don't know. I think that the odds were already against, were lengthy against him escaping, even by March, April, 1917, things were closing down around him. And they lost vital weeks as well, vital time, because the, the Tsar's children had measles, so they didn't want to travel. So had they gone immediately, they got the offer of asylum from Britain in that five days or one week period, they might have managed to escape. But, you know, already it would have been a perilous journey for them because the Bolshevik army units were already on the lookout for them. So they may not have even made it then. So, yes, it was a tragic, a very tragic story. And then had they survived, had they got out, how would that, that relationship developed had they been in England? Well, I think it would have been, I mean, you know, had the whole family got out or there was an attempt right at the end just to get the three girls, the three youngest daughters out. And uh, Princess Victoria Mountbatten, who was the elder sister of both of the Tsarina and her family, um, desperately tried through the British embassy and British government to negotiate right to the end to get the three young grand duchesses out. That was... Um, uh, Tatiana, Maria, and Anastasia. Uh, the Bolsheviks by that time were not willing to discuss the Tsar or the Tsarina or the Tsarevich or the eldest daughter leaving Russia. But she tried to make a case that the youngest daughters should be released and come to live with them on the Isle of Wight uh, in East Cowles. And she said they'd be very um, safe there and they wouldn't meet any Russians, she guaranteed. They'd be kept well away from all politics and they'd just live quietly with her on the Isle of Wight. Um, well, I suspect it would have been a problem if, for the, if the Romanovs had come to Britain because the, the new Soviet government um, would have been very angry with Britain for offering them refuge. So it would have damaged relations between Russia and Britain 
you know, with the, with the communist government, with the Soviet government for quite a period of time, because they would have saying, return the Romanovs to us. Why are you keeping them? Why are you protecting them? <laughs> the, you know, ironically, in the same way the Tsarist government was demanding the return of radical political exiles back in the 19th century, the new Soviet government would have demanded the return of the Romanovs, I'm sure, to stand trial or whatever. So it would have, it would have complicated you know, the, the whole ratio, they would have become, they would have, they're, you know, Britain's been home to many exiled royalist families. You know, we have to look most recently at the King of Greece or, you know, Constantine who fled Greece in 1967 after the coup d'etat and came to live in London. The French royal family found, found shelter in Britain for many years during their exile from France, you know, and so forth. So they would have become an emigre, um, imperial family, you know, they would have been, had some attachment to the British court, they'd have been invited to functions, but they would have lived a private, fairly private life. And they probably would have attracted around them an emigre circle of people who wanted a restoration of the monarchy in Russia, it would have been a focal point. Um, you only have to look at what happened to the Tsar's mother, you know, she, she fled and escaped from the Tsar's sisters. Uh, the Tsar, you know, one of them, Tsar, uh, Grand Duchess Zania, the sister of Nicholas lived in Hampton Court Palace till she died in 1960. And the grand and the mother of the Tsar went to Denmark back to her homeland. And she lived in a small palace in Copenhagen. And there was a sort of little Lenny Gray circle of aristocrats and others around them, you know, who recognized them still as being, but they they were didn't amount to anything political and or important in that sense. So I think they would have faded into some sort of obscurity eventually. You know, so the rough it's always very interesting how history tends to go in these circles yeah. where liberal, authoritarian, yes, senders yes. the radicals back, senders the yes. czars back. Yes, so. yes, exactly. So it would have been a, it would have probably been um, a gradual fading away. I think you know, unless the unless the very fact the czar had survived or his family survived meant that the White Russian forces uh, managed to launch a successful counter coup against the Bolshevik government. You know, because there was a civil war, in which case. The white Russians could have won the war, you know, uh, at some point, but they didn't in the end. But had they had the figurehead of the Tsar still, maybe they might have won and rallied people around them and overthrown the Bolshevik government and restored the Tsarist system. Certainly my grandfather <laughs> always believed the Tsars would be restored. So he positioned himself on the Russian border, the Polish-Russian border, as close as possible to get back. Uh, he always told my father, you know, he gave my father and his sister Russian names because he said, you know, we may be here in Vilnius, in Vilna, temporarily, but as soon as the Tsars are restored, I'll be back. We'll be back in Moscow again. Um, so a lot of Russian exiles did hope for a restoration of the Romanovs, there's no doubt. Wow, that's really interesting. Yeah, yeah I don't know. Uh, thank you very much for that, Stephen. Now, yeah. now for your final fun question, as we hear, do here on the History of Jackson podcast. Yes. Always yeah. ask a fun question for our guest. Now, yes, okay. <laughs> you've you've lived and worked all over the world for all, yes. you know working yes. for the British Council. Yeah. And yeah. what are your be oh three favourite places that you have visited? Well, that's uh, that's a good question because as yes, you're right, I've lived and worked in a whole variety of places. Um, I I you know I I have to say there is a Russian city in there. Um, that is St. Petersburg. Um, I visited there several times while I worked for the British Council. Um, and it spoke to me very much, actually, because my grandparents spent a lot of time there. A lot of my family were, were based in St. Petersburg. And going back there in the late 1990s, you know, and suddenly seeing all these places that my father had mentioned and talked about where the family lived meant a lot to me. You know, it's a magnificent city with great wide streets and the River Neva flowing through it and, you know, wonderful sort of 18th century classical palaces and, uh, you know, but yet with a very strong Russian atmosphere to it as well underneath all that, you know, with lots of beautiful, lovely restaurants, music, art, literature and so forth. So St. Petersburg would be up there, but certainly very high up. Um, I also enjoyed very much Brussels, surprisingly. I worked there for five years, six years. Um, again, that's sort of a melting point of many cultures. You know, Belgium was a country that was under different empires at different times. It was under the Spanish for a while, it's been under the French, it's been under the Dutch, you know, it was, uh, it was under the Habsburgs, it was, 
So it's absorbed all these different influences and, and it makes it, people think of Brussels as a rather gray bureaucratic city to do with the EU, you know, but there's always been two Brussels. There's been the Brussels of the, of the officials, ruling officials, and the EU is the latest, I suppose, and the Brussels of the ordinary people, the Belgians who live there, which is a colorful, lively, uh, very um, enjoyable place, you know, with a rich history and rich culture. Um, and uh, where would I choose a third place? Probably somewhere very different. Um, I spent uh, a lot of time in Indonesia. And wow. Very much loved um, Java, which is the main island of Indonesia. Again, for the mix of cultures, Hindu, Buddhist, Muslim, Christian, a lot of different traditions, a lot of different histories. You know, you've got Buddhist temples, also Hindu temples, also Islamic mosques, alongside Christian churches. You know, and I just found it absolutely fascinating and a totally different culture from a European culture. You know, learning about uh, Sanskrit and Javanese and Indonesian and the Dutch colonial history there, which is very interesting. And it's a beautiful island, you know, a sort of a tropical idyll in many ways. So probably those three places, I would say, are, are very important to me. Well, that's that's very varied and absolutely fascinating. Yes. Uh, especially with the inclusion of Indonesia in there. Yes, we're not that. <laughs> <laughs> definitely wasn't. Yes. Now, if our listeners would want to interact with the topics more yeah. and learn more about yes. what we've spoken about today, yeah. what would you recommend that they go out and read? Um, well, in terms of books, I've got a selection of, of uh, different books, which are, I think... Um, Simon Seabag Montefiore's The Romanovs has got to be a standard. Um, I mean, my book uh, obviously looks at the Romanovs and Britain. Uh, this is a, a, a review of the Romanovs in their entirety across, you know, relationship with countries around the world, different countries. And so it's a big, a big political and, and imperial history of the Romanovs. So definitely if you want to know more about the Romanovs, that would be a very interesting book. Um, I think also a book. Um, by Douglas Smith, Former People, um, which is very interesting, is a study of the collapse of Russians, ru Russia's ruling class in 1917 and 1918 during the Russian Revolution. Uh, you know, and that spoke to me very much because of what happened to my own family. Uh, but it shows the extent to which it's almost without parallel in history that an entire ruling elite you know, was removed from power and destroyed and was scattered across the world in, in different ways, in different countries, you know, from, you know, a big Russian emigre who was in France, in England, in America, and, you know, uh, it's very rare in historical terms that, that, you know, that a country has lost its entire ruling class to that degree at one fell swoop. That is an interesting book. I think Helen Rappaport's book, The Race to Save the Romanovs, is a very interesting one, and again goes in a lot more detail, you know, could the Romanovs have been saved? You know, what happened to the British, you know, did the British monarchy betray them or not? Um, and what were all the different plots to save the Romanovs? That's a, a really a good book. Um, I also, this is well, is Orlando Figues, A People's Tragedy, which you probably may be aware of. Yeah. The game is an extraordinary journey into the revolution and what happened to Russia in those years and the collapse of Romanov rule. Um, in, in 1917, 1918. Um, it's just a fabulous book, actually, in terms of, of that. So um, those, I don't want to, I could go on, obviously, but those are the <laughs> four that I would say are well worth reading. Yes. Um, and I would also say, if you want to read um, an interesting novel, Turgenev's Fathers and Sons started in the Isle of Wight. Um, that's where he got his inspiration is a very interesting study in a way of how Russia was feeling at that period of its history in the, in the 1860s and 70s. You know, as Russia began to industrialize, as you began to the shift from the countryside to the, uh, the cities, the rise of a new young intelligentsia and professionals, all this change was happening in Russia. And it was causing different stresses and strains and creating you know, uh, all kinds of strange cultural shifts within the Russian society. It's not a bit, it's not a long novel, but it's fascinating for the figure of Yevgeny Bazarov, which Turgenev conjures up. His most, probably his most famous novel, 
of one of Russia's greatest novels of the 19th century. So um, I, I would certainly recommend that. Oh, brilliant. And they will be in the description of the podcast and YouTube video for all our listeners as well, so they can get yes. their hands yes. on those yes. copies. Yeah. 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 And you know, you, you're absolutely amazing at knowing your topic, you're passionate about it. And if people want to interact with you more online, where can they find you, Stephen? Well, I'm, I'm sort of available on Goodreads. I'd, um, I've got, and I'm also available through the Medina Publishing, through my publisher's website. So I post things to that and so forth. Um, I don't personally have a Facebook account. Uh, that's a personal decision. I decided not to. So I don't, people can't reach me that way. But they can certainly reach me through things like Goodreads and, my, and, and the Medina Publishing sites and so, other social media sites which okay. my publisher monitor for me quite regularly to see what's been thrown up in awesome. question. And there is, if anyone wants to stay in touch with the book as well, there is an Isles and Empires uh, Instagram account as well. There is, yeah, yeah, there is. Um, been... And a Facebook account for Isles and Empires as well. Yeah, and so, they have been pushing out some fantastic content. And they have. I have an excellent team and colleagues who <laughs> have <Hannah's out, laughs> you know, particularly taking the lead on all that, as, my, as she is Medina's... Uh, social media and uh you know promotions system um so we we have a very lively amount of stuff going out both on the medina sites but also on things like goodreads and various um facebook groups as well you know there are a lot of romanov groups on facebook where we're pushing information out about island empires and different events and so forth and i will just like to say a personal thank you to you and medina publishing for sending me a copy of your book i do really appreciate it and i've absolutely loved it Oh, thank you very much. And uh, I hope the uh, my grandson screaming in the background hasn't been too distracted. No, not at all. I didn't hear him. <laughs> yeah, it's his feeding time. And I think it's <laughs> breakfast or bedtime. <laughs> so, uh, well, thank you very much, Stephen. Thank you very much, Jackson. And it's been a real pleasure. And, um, you know, it's, it's great to talk with uh, people like yourself who are knowledgeable um, and interested and passionate, I may say, about history. Oh, thank know, you very much. Uh, uh, you know, as a historian, you know, I really value the opportunity to bring history to life. That's my my objective. You know, I could have written a dry as dust academic book about the subject, but I decided to make it this make it very accessible to people because that's the way I relate to history. It's through stories and through through events and through human events. I think which makes history up. You know, all of us are part of that great narrative of history, aren't we? In, in that sense, so uh, yeah. Thank you very much for allowing me to, to bring this story to life on your show. And thank you very much for agreeing to come onto my podcast. It's been a huge honour to have you on, and I really appreciate it. Thank you very much, thank, Stephen. Thank you very much. Right. All the best. Um,